Welcome to Bible Theory Podcast, hosted by the Chicano Knox. Finally, a podcast about the church for the church. Bible Theory is for the streets, homie. This ain't your boy scout, choir boy type of podcast. This is for the Vato Locos who have been saved by the blood of Christ, homie. Coming straight out of Geneva. Donde están mis soldados reformados? Bienvenido a la Teoría de la Biblia podcast con el Chicano Knox. You are now entering into the reformed state of mind, homie. Where we study ecclesiology and take it to the streets, homie. Coming from that five solas. Coming from that reformed underground railroad, homie. Coming from that West West 1646, that's it. All right, all right. It's that time of day again. Thank you so much for listening to Bible Theory. This is your host, the Chicano Knox, uh, coming live and direct from the scriptorium, the, uh, you know, the Reform Underground Studios. And it's been such a journey, man, listening to many different shows, connecting with uh, networking with other content creators, uh, Reform and, you know, Calvinistic creators, uh, both on Facebook and on YouTube. Uh, you know, it's been it's been a, such a joy to, you know, partner with them, um, you know, be interviewed um, and featured on their shows. Uh, so I want to give a shout out to all those people. You know who you are. So shout out to all them. Gotham City. Hashtag Gotham City. Um, anyways, don't forget to like, subscribe and uh, share this uh, with your friends um, and with the church people. Uh, you know, Bible theory is about the church. It's about ecclesiology. It's uh, the doctrine of the church. Who is the church? What is the church? How do you define the church? Local church, invisible church, all of that. And, and, and it's not just seminarian, librarian type talk. This is for, you know, I want, I want this to be a, a gateway drug for, for people on the street to be like, wow, this is the church. Okay. Because I thought the church was like for like hypocrites or I thought the church was like, for like, you know, all those religious Bible thumpers, you know what I mean? People have stereotypes and people have a lot of baggage and experiences with church. So it's a great time to be reintroducing the church to the culture, I think. And it's, it's a perfect time to uh, re-educate, re-catechize uh, kids and adults, senators, governors, <laughs> lay people about the church. And that's what I do. Um, and, and if you find that a blessing, go ahead and uh, follow me on Spotify as well and on Twitter. Um, so I have a special guest with me, um, Patrick, uh, me and Patrick, you know, I know him for like maybe a, a little over a year or just a year now. And, you know, I met him, uh, you know, last year, I think, um, he's from Colorado, just like me. And, you know, we went to the, um, Super Bowl outreach, uh, Super Bowl 55, if I'm correct, 55 or 56, I lost count, but it was in LA, you know, we, you know, so we, we done a little, a little outreach there. Uh, so I, I invite him on because we're going to be talking about Pentecostalism and Pentecostalism does involve ecclesiology because, you know, it is a church body uh, of church believers, of uh, people who call themselves Pentecostalism. What is Pentecostalism? Why does it matter? Looking at the history, let's zoom in. Who are these people speaking in tongues, healing? All these things are very commonly associated with Pentecostals. And that's what we're going to do. And that's why I call the show Enter the Pentecost. And that, you know, we're going to try our best. We're going to have fun. We're going to be talking about it, but we're going to be talking about it um, in a spirit of love. Uh, we want to exhort one another, sharpen, iron sharpens iron. You know what I mean? And we want to uh, stay faithful to the Word of God. We want to exposit the Word of God. Uh, theology matters. You know what I mean? Theology does matter. And doctrine does matter. And that's what the show is about, too, because we have to stay faithfully, historically, and accountable to the Word of God, Sola Scriptura. And, you know, that, that's what we're going to do. So if you're a Pentecostal and you're listening, we have nothing but love for you. We hope that you would um, listen in with the spirit um, and open-mindedness and open Bible. So 
All right, so we're going to go ahead and uh, shout out to everybody in uh, Brazil. I just found out that I have tons of listeners in Brazil, Portuguese, all my Portugal brothers uh, who are speaking Portuguese in Brazil. Shout out. Let me know where you're listening. Um, Bible theory from hashtag Brazil. Uh, Patrick, uh, for those who don't know you, uh, give a little mm -hmm. introduction, who you are and what you do. Well, I uh, am a Colorado native. I was born in Denver. Colorado and grew up there, a Roman Catholic. Uh, went to parochial schools, uh, which are the, the schools associated with the local church, Roman Catholic Church in each uh, diocese there. And went uh, all the way through as well at uh, a Jesuit high school in Denver um, called Regis High School. And so I, I had a very um, thoroughly Catholic upbringing um, and uh, came to faith after I uh, graduated from high school and, and left to go to college in uh, Fort Collins, where I'm living now. Uh, met my wife up here, and uh, we've been been uh, together for uh, almost four years. So it's been it's been a, a pretty long journey. And uh, when I came to faith, really the first church that I uh, went to. Uh, was a Pentecostal church and uh, fairly, fairly small and uh, really, you know, a lot of great people and, uh, you know, a family kind of uh, feel to it. And they're you know, really, at, at that point, I didn't know much at all about the Bible or, uh, you know, I just started to read it and tried to start to understand what had happened to me. Um, I've been witnessed to by a coworker on a summer job um, in uh, between uh, when I graduated from high school and uh, my second second uh, year of college. The summer between my first and second year of college, I was witnessed to by them, and and God saved me and brought me into His kingdom. And you know, I started trying to figure out, okay, what's happened here, and and I started to look for a church and landed at at a church that uh, was uh, pastored by by a man who was definitely you know part of the Pentecostal movement and uh, it you know just was what I what I knew and uh, my my I met, met my wife there and we uh, spent uh, about 25 years total in in the charismatic flesh Pentecostal movement and so that's kind of the basic background that uh that you know to start the conversation off yeah absolutely and you know uh, pentecostalism you know a lot of people have associations with that how, how would you define it you know how, how would you define a pentecostal or pentecostalism if you want to just give a brief description um, for somebody listening so they could you know understand it better Sure. I mean, basically, the the Pentecostal movement it started in the early 1900s. Uh, as as far as the the modern movement, uh, uh, Charles Parham was uh, a pastor who had a, had a school in uh, in Kansas, I believe it was. And around 1900, a number of the students there began to experience what they believed was was speaking in tongues and the uh, baptism of the Holy Spirit. Um, it it uh, began to spread and went to uh, the Azusa Street in Los Angeles, where there was there was a lot of similar uh, manifestations and people speaking in tongues and I think reports of healings. And uh, it, it went on for you know, a number of years, I think, over over 10 years at, at Azusa Street and pretty much all of the Pentecostal denominations and churches that are born out of those those early movements in the United States and uh, I, I'm sure there's more to more to it but that's kind of the basic uh, basic idea but it was that they would that they believed that they had received um, the baptism of the Holy Spirit in the same way that we see it in the book of Acts and and 
a restoration of gifts of healing and and um, some of those types of things as well you know prophecy and uh it, it's kind of interesting to to note that the women preachers were a, a, a strong part of the uh, the azusa street revival especially i mean and and it was um the, one of the main preachers there in that particular uh revival as, as it was called was a african-american man i'm named william seymour and uh it was certainly unorthodox and and evidently you know kind of in the lower um uh economic you know spectrum people that were were probably not you know quite as um quite as educated and, and so forth but for the people that were involved, it seemed to be, you know, a very genuine kind of thing, a very, you know, powerful restoration of, you know, the things that were happening in the Book of Acts. Hmm. Uh, so, I wanted to share a couple of memes with you that would help us to get a visual, because okay. you know, sometimes sometimes a picture is worth a thousand words, like they say. And I don't know about you or my listeners. If you're listening to this on Spotify or Google Podcasts. You may not you may not see this portion. I encourage you to go to YouTube and watch this because I'm about to share some cool memes. Um, let me see if I can share this real quick. I wanted to share a couple of memes with you here. All right. Do you see it now? Yeah. All right. So uh, go. Uh, it says you, you have a. Let me see. It looks like a man and a woman here, and the meme is like he's like uh, the woman is asking the husband or you know her boyfriend a question, and she's like, "Did the Bereans examine Paul's heart or examine the scriptures to see if Paul if Paul's doctrine was sound?" Did you catch that? Yeah. <laughs> and then he's like. Uh, he he's not a false teacher. You you don't know his heart. So you know stuff like this um, is very re revealing because it's like there are they are some of the Pentecostals right are not Bereans. So it's kind of like a pun. Bereans were were very investigative, inquisitive type people, analytical. You may want to give them the personality. Perhaps we don't right. know for sure, but. It gives us an indication maybe they were inquisitive, they were uh, investigative, analytical type people, smart, right? Um, but they were also examining what Paul was saying. Paul the Apostle. And Paul the Apostle, as, as we know, is a very gifted individual. He was the writer of pretty much 13 letters in the New Testament. And they were checking him. <laughs> but they were not checking his heart. <laughs> to see if it was if he was found, they were checking his scripture. Right, uh, and I think part of the part of the thing that I experienced was that um, it really wasn't so much about doctrine, um, so much about what the Bible says. It was more about the experience in a lot of cases, and it's more becomes more and more about what God is saying as opposed to what God has said. So even though those two things are supposed to be equal or they're supposed to be, you know, you're, you're not, you know, they're not wanting to depart from the Bible. I mean, any, you know, good, solid Pentecostal would say, look, we're, you know, the Bible is our, is our basis. Um, but when you believe that you're hearing from God directly, you know, I mean, you're getting it hot off the press, you know, which is going to take precedence. And it, it, it's very, very possible that they are hearing from God. Like, well, what is the best way that people can hear from God, you think? Well, during during the apostolic period, people did hear directly from God in the sense that the Lord spoke to them and gave them a, you know, instructions. But even during the Book of Acts, if you if you do a study in the Book of Acts, 
the, the amount of times that that happened is really uh, pretty uh, small. It's not something that like every day the apostle got up and the Holy Spirit said, go do this or do that. I mean, it, it ends up being, you know, a handful of times really um, for you know, the individuals that were involved in that period of inscripturation. But in general, even at that time, you know, they were they were looking to God's word. They were looking to the the words that have been spoken before by the prophets and now had been spoken by the son. And so they were very focused on the word of God, even in this time when the Holy Spirit was speaking in a special way to to the apostles and 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 some others. But uh, the the focus really today, I, I would argue now, should be on God's word. And it doesn't mean God can't lead you or guide you. I may even give you impressions at times that end up being providential. But that is not that's not what was happening in the Book of Acts. They were they they weren't uh, just getting an impression and then trying to figure out if that was you know, providential or not. They were, when God spoke, it was, it was absolutely clear that he was speaking, which no one really has that today. I would, okay. we would argue. If you, if you want to hear God speak, all you have to do is open the Bible and read out loud. That's what I was told. <laughs> yeah. Amen. I mean, that's, you know, like it is God's and the Holy Spirit enlightens us and, uh, it is part of, I mean, believing in uh, the Reformed doctrine of Sola Scriptura, that is the sole infallible rule of faith and practice, and that it's, it's, we, it's sufficient. It, we don't need more than what is given to us. We don't need additional revelation from God today because he's given us his word, that which is complete. And uh, again, it doesn't mean God can't lead you and guide you, but he does it providentially and it's something that you you find out um at you know through uh your uh walking you know let's say for instance you get a an impression that you need to call somebody and check on them and it turns out that they really needed some encouragement or something well you didn't know that before you called them and found out that they were in the situation they were in so it's not the same thing as God speaking to you. I, we, I would argue, you know, and maybe it's just a semantic thing for some people, but for the Pentecostals, it really is a doctrinal uh, plank or doctrinal uh, stance that they take that that revelation is ongoing. Yeah, and that's problematic because that, that brings up, that makes it a very messy, slippery slope. Here's another meme. Yeah. So, so wh whenever you're asked to be a substitute uh, preschool teacher in the youth group or something at a Pentecostal school, it's always wise to uh, pop in a DVD, <laughs> American, uh, the American Gospel documentary. Uh, I'm not sure if you are familiar with that documentary. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so why why is this mean hits home? Like what, what? What's so truthful about this meme? You think? Well, in the, the and this is part of the thing that that's difficult because when you are in some ways maybe criticizing a point of view among other Christians, and and I do think that we're not talking about. Uh, in in vast majority of cases, we're not talking about people that are outside the pale of orthodoxy. But the the reality is that when you're taught things that Scripture don't teach, it it is detrimental to your to your health um, and your growth as a Christian. And one of the things that we found in our 25 years was that we really didn't grow that much. I mean we were trying to grow and we you know i think eventually 
were able to come out of it because we did spend a, a decent amount of time studying the Bible and trying to you know really be diligent about that. And uh, some some uh, churches that are more um, on the, not necessarily there's a we can talk about those between charismatic and Pentecostal. Um, there's there's a lot of similarities, but in general, the, the Pentecostals were also very much into kind of a separation and holiness, um, whereas the Charismatics are less uh, that way. Like, but for a Pentecostal, you would probably um, have been taught that you can't uh, go to any, go to any kind of movies or um, have any you no know, real entertainment of that type in your life. In in a lot of cases, and you know today i don't you know that how much that is is uh the thought now but it was it it was more that way among pentecostals than charismatics as far as as far as my experience goes amen and that's uh what what dr mike michael horton would say the therapeutic moralistic gospel don't do this don't do that believe in jesus but don't do this don't do that don't go out or well, what's that one saying don't chew, don't go out or chew tobacco with girls that do or something like that. I'm probably butchering no, it. I, but. Don't, I don't drink, I don't chew, I don't go with girls who do. Or right, right. And, and that's so that hits home because that's not the gospel. It, right. The gospel says, uh, be holy like Christ is holy. So therefore, don't, don't, don't chew tobacco. Don't chew tobacco. It's like, well, there's a lot of consequences to your health, right? When you chew tobacco, possibly. But yeah. are you going to go? Are you going to go to hell if you chew if you chew tobacco one time? Probably not. That's not a doctrinal statement in the Bible. Oh, you know what I mean? Right. But they make it into one, like you say. They add to the gospel. They they uh, it's, it becomes moralistic. Your 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 it becomes therapeutic. Well, yeah. That is very true, and a lot of what we experienced uh, was we we got some good teaching, of course. A lot of it was biblical, but the overall thrust was more about you and what you're doing or not doing. And we really were kind of in in the dark when it came to having a clear understanding of what the gospel was. I mean, I think if anyone's saved, they have a basic understanding of it, I would say, because if you don't have a basic understanding that you know it's it's Jesus and it's by grace uh, through faith then you're not I don't see how you really could be very confident that you're actually saved so we we knew that but it didn't go much beyond that and that's that that's that because the gospel should be focused and central um, yeah. in, in the in the church service obviously the scriptures should be central in the church service and the gospel should always um charles spurgeon will always say that he always tried to fit in the gospel um in his sermon and you know a lot of people say the word gospel is a, it's a loose word nowadays uh, mm. it's tossed yeah. it's tossed it's tossed around but the fully orb gospel is not fully taught in, in from the pulpit you know what i mean that's why you see the church apostles you know backsliding and, and you know uh synchronizing with the world and stuff. Now, let me go ahead and share another meme. Let's see if we get this one. Um, let's see. All right. All right. Tell me what you think about this one. Okay. Uh, so now, that's what I mean. No, it's from Lord of the Rings. Right. And, uh, the, I forget what the director's name is, but. Is uh, Peter Jackson? So this is Peter Jackson, Lord of the Rings, Christopher Lee, and um, the other guy. So uh, this is a great analogy. And if you're if you're hearing this, you would not see this. So go ahead and go ahead on YouTube and you'll see it. So this is this is a pun. Uh, and and I'm I'm getting I'm getting somewhere with this. Uh, this right here, you see Gandalf right here. This is kind of like a Presbyterian. Okay, this is a Presbyterian, doctrinally historical you know, confessional. And then this guy over here, uh, what's his name? Sauron, um, Christopher Lee. He's kind of like a, kind of like a Calvinistic Baptist or 
you can even say a reform Anglican in there. You know what I mean? And then Peter Jackson is supposed to represent, you know, the Pentecostal youth pastor hanging out. <laughs> yeah. So, so with that being said, it's very common among Pentecostalism to really distance themselves from church history, from the confessional, from the, from the quote unquote traditional. Just like this picture suggests, is that you have two old dudes that are wise, that are wizardry, but they kind of, though, you know, they put in that context that I just said, you know, uh, historical reform, Baptist, uh, you know, you know, uh, you know, you know, Presbyterian, Calvinistic, stuff like that. And then you get this Pentecostal guy, Pentecostal youth pastor just trying to hang out. And it's like, you kind of look at it, you're like, hmm, it doesn't fit. You know what I mean? Something just seems odd. Yeah. <laughs> so what, what is your experience with uh, Pentecostalism? And with them distancing themselves from from confessional historical Christianity. Well, really, there was I mean, there was very little, if any, connection that was discernible in in our experience. Uh, even even the history of Pentecostalism was not something that was talked about very much the the idea was of course it was a restoration of the infilling of the holy spirit and all of that but it only went back to 1900 and so there's not much history there i mean it's just uh and i really didn't learn much about um i didn't know what you know um calvinism or you know uh, the more the or reformed points of view really were something that we didn't have any uh, or certainly not much exposure to at all. Of course, this was before the days of you know the internet, and so you didn't have the information readily available. If you wanted to get a book, you had to go down to the local Christian bookstore, and a lot of those books were uh just kind of the popular uh writers of the day and there was a lot of stuff that you know really now you know i i would if i had a shelf for it i would put it in the don't you know don't read or at least don't pay too much attention to shelf but uh i i just don't think and again it's about the experience you're having today it's not about what god has said it's not really even about what has happened in the past it's really it's really more about uh today's experience one of the the larger churches that we went to that was uh a pentecostal charismatic church they had a big sign up on the highway that said experience jesus you know come to our church and there's some truth to that. I mean, obviously, we want that we want to acknowledge that there's an experiential side to the Christian faith that, that it should be changing your life, your manner of life should reflect the faith that you have, and there's a vital kind of uh, transformation that should be taking place in your in your mind and in your 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 heart, your attitude, and the way that you think and speak and all of those things. So we're not saying the experience is unimportant. It's just the experience that they're talking about um, among the Pentecostal charismatic. It's it's more an uh, an experience of uh, well, some people call it emotionalism, and uh, which I mean I can appreciate the fact that. There's some enthusiasm there. There's some there's some uh, desire to to worship God, you know, uh, raising your hands or clapping or you know, those types of things. I don't think are you know they're not out of bounds necessarily. It's just our where is our focus ultimately? Is it on our feelings and on you know how we're. Uh, experiencing something or is it you know is it on christ and you know uh, 
on on uh, the gospel and the, the truth of who God is. And uh, so it, it's quite different. I mean, the thing that we really experienced that kind of helped begin to draw us out of that, that charismatic movement was just going to a church that was more was more Christ focused. Like you could just tell when the songs that uh, were sung that they were much more focused on God and Christ as on, as opposed to on ourselves. Whereas, you know, when we were the normal, you know, kind of choruses that we sang and stuff, it was, a lot of it was focused on ourselves and kind of, it's almost a bit of a pep rally type of thing. You know, we're marching forward in the power of the spirit and, you know, and again, it's not all, it's not all bad. To, I mean, there's plenty. I mean, David talks about himself and his, his experience with God and stuff, but you can overdo that very easily. Um, it seems to me your, your, our focus ultimately should be on God and Christ and, and uh, you know, only secondarily on ourselves. Hey Amen. If you really want to um, look at a church, you know, w- you know, when you walk into the building, obviously, I did another episode on what is the church. The the building structure is not the church. You know what I mean? Obviously, we are the church, but you know what I mean when you walk into these places, Pentecostals or charismatic churches, right? And just go to their bookstore and see what kind of books they have. Here's a couple red flags. Joe Osteen, bad. Beth Moore, that's a red flag. Rick Warren, another red flag. Mm-hmm. T.D. Jake, big, big red flag. Oh, how about this? No bookstore at all. <laughs> Maybe because they don't have money. I get it. Maybe it's a smaller thing. They're renting from a hotel room. I get it. Uh, maybe the pastor has a book, and that's the only book you find is his book. <laughs> uh, maybe you find, like, uh, maybe, maybe, just maybe, you find a John Piper book. Okay, well, that's, you know, you, you, that's better than a Joe Osteen book. <laughs> I give you that. But no book, no, you know what I mean? Like what you said, go to the bookstore, see what you find. And there should be a tons of red flags coming up. If you find Calvin's Institute, hey, that's pretty good, man. If you find, um, you know, lectures to my students, that's good. That's good. Now, now you got it going, man, you know what I mean? Uh, biography of William Tyndale, biography of George Whitfield, biographies of St. Patrick. You got all kinds of things going on in church history. If you don't find none of that, none of the church history has whatsoever, I think that's a red flag for me. It is. Because what the church is doing is distancing themselves from um, our predecessors, from the foundations of the church. Obviously, obviously, Christ is the cornerstone. Obviously, you go to the bookstore, if they, they sell Bibles, that's, that's fine, too. If they don't, that, that should be a red flag, too, obviously. If they don't sell Bibles, right? Uh, um, let me let me show you another one here. This one. <laughs> yeah. Yeah or day. Yeah or day. Put your thumb up or down. <laughs> so when when you get a phone call or a phone request or a friend request, and it, it's somebody, it has the name apostle or prophet prophet in front of their name. What's your thoughts on that? Well, yeah, um, I guess unless it's their given name, you know, um, you definitely want to, I think, steer clear of someone who claims to be an apostle or prophet today um, for for a number of reasons that we've talked about. Uh, I I think that to, to some extent, the, the idea of, of Pentecostalism is that uh, those those offices were something that should have you know either should have continued or did continue, and therefore you have apostles and prophets today. And sometimes people try to put it into a, a different category, like a missionary that's planning churches might be considered an apostle or something, or you know someone who preaches really well, um, really passionately might be considered a prophet or something. But I don't really think that's a biblical um, category, right? That that is uh, very very uh, 
that's not it's not at least not helpful and in and in general i mean if someone is calling themselves an apostle i would argue that you can be sure that there are faults that there's something right. seriously right. wrong i mean i don't know if they're an absolute false teacher without examining their you know they may not deny essential christian doctrine but they're claiming something that um you know what makes them an apostle right because uh, the, the scripture scriptures are clear they, they have to see jesus resurrected right they had to be commissioned by Jesus, by the Lord himself, to, yeah. be, to be an apostle, right? You can't just be self-appointed, self-claimed, self-made, right? You can't graduate from seminary and be like, I'm an apostle now. That, that, that right. doesn't exist, right? Prophet, Old Testament, you know, John the Baptist, you know, someone who was commissioned by God, right, to foretell and forth tell the future as well bring forward the word of god thus thus saith the lord like the old testament says you're speaking on the behalf of god you're the you're the mouthpiece of god in some sense that's what pastors are that's what church leaders are they're, they're, they're kind of like the mouthpieces of god but they're, they're they're not speaking on the behalf of god in a sense like like isaiah was he was commissioned by god and he's speaking like directly and, right. um, in, a, in a sense, pastors are speaking on the behalf of God because they're delivering the gospel every Sunday. They're preaching a sermon. They're speaking with that authority. But they're like a pastor is a little lower than the prophet Isaiah. Like the, Isaiah was it's, it's a little different. And he, he and he's predicting the future. He's talking about the future Israel, talking about the future Zion. You know what I mean? So the prophet also has that element of. Uh, uh, predicting the future in that sense. And when you are a prophet, what does Moses say? Right? You have to be with what? 100% accuracy? 97% accuracy? How about 29% accuracy? Right? How about 99.9% .9 accuracy? Is that a prophet? No. Right? right. So you got to, people got to be careful when they go around, start proclaiming, but like, this city will be saved. And it's like, is that a prophecy? Is that like a declaration? Like, like yes, I want the city to be saved, but oh, it will be saved within ten years. <laughs> or you know, a lot of people went out in COVID. Remember, COVID will be banished in the name of the Lord. How many people have heard that? Right? You know what I mean? If there were prophets and apostles with the gift of healing and all that. Why don't they just go to the hospitals and just heal everybody? What's holding them back? So, yeah. You know what I mean? That's my question. Mm -hmm. What's holding them back? Right. Going to the hospitals and just start healing every single room, every single baby in the NICU, PICU, right? In the ER, the ED, emergency room, whatever they call it nowadays. What's holding these people back? I don't know. Yeah. And I, I think they would say something along the lines of God's not leading them to do that or but um, you know, during during the time that the apostles, uh, like Peter's shadow following on whoever w was sick and laid out in, into the street, were were healed. And uh, in Jesus' case, you know, he healed he healed everybody in um, those towns and villages and stuff where he was preaching. I mean, and it, I think one of the things to point out is. That those those gifts and those miracles uh, were performed in the way that they were at that time in order to be a sign to the world that these people were in fact uh, preaching the gospel that had been given to them by Christ. These people were in fact apostles uh, anointed by uh, the Holy Spirit. And that it was part of that foundational uh, period where they needed those signs to be a confirmation of the message that they were preaching. But as time went on, uh, those things uh, were no longer needed because the, the foundation was laid. And the apostles, uh, we, I, we would argue from the reform side of things that apostles and prophets were not intended to be an enduring office 
and the the and also just looking at history that's obvious it seems that they weren't intended to be an enduring office because you don't have anyone that is doing that type of thing today with all the claims and all of that if you look at it carefully there is no one that is doing uh doing signs or making prophecies uh that are coming to pass in in the way that uh the apostles and prophets were doing so let me let me put on another mean let's see if you get this one <laughs> so you have bernie sanders obviously the famous meme he was uh when he was just sitting there everybody else around him in celebration mode so on one side you have a pentecostal who is bored with the sermon and then you have a baptist on the other side enjoying a sermon <laughs> Oh, uh, tell tell me about this. Um, you know, I went to actually. I just found the church recently. I just became a member recently. Uh, you add COVID on top of that, the lockdown, me moving to a different city. It took me about two, three and a half years mm-hmm. to find to find to find a a church, right? To become a member. Uh, you know what I mean? And you ha- you add COVID in the lockdown, and you know, visiting different churches. Every, you know, when you visit a church. And you're like, I, I think I want to go to this church because I want to become a member. I want to be, I want, I want to, I want to participate. I want to be, I want to be accountable, right? I want to submit to an authority. I want to participate and grow, right? That's our intention. And it's hard. It's so hard. And I get it. And you know, you 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 know, you, you have to go to the church maybe like visit it every like maybe like five Sundays. You have to give it like five or six Sundays to really give it a great feel. You know what I mean? I'm, and I'm talking about like what style of leadership they are, what kind of confession they hold, what kind of church discipline they do. What is their view on the Lord's Supper? Do they protect the Lord's Supper or do they just give it out to any homeless walking down the street? You know what I mean? Because it does matter. Like all these right. things matter. Sermons. And one thing, one of the little things, and I visited three Pentecostal churches, actually. I really considered three Pentecostal churches. And one of them I really liked. And I won't give out the names. And I visited them. I visited them. And one thing I did notice in all three of those Pentecostal churches, almost nobody had Bibles. I was like the only one carrying my big old Bible, you know, my ESV. And yeah. I was like, you know what I mean? Because they turn on the light. You know what I mean? And it's kind of like dark. And I was like, I can't take notes, man. Like, I, I can't see anything. Like, I have to bring my own flashlight. And like the only thing, the only thing that was lit up, the only thing that was lit up was the stage. They had like all kinds of expensive concert lights up there for sure. But everybody else was like dark. And I looked around and no one had like Bible. It was a couple people, but it wasn't that many. I was taking notes and I was like, what? You know what I mean? Like, I mean, whatever, you know, you need, whatever you need, they put up on the screen for you. So you don't need to bring a Bible. That's so sad. Like, I think Christians should bring Bibles, like bring their notebooks be engaging listen yeah. expect, well, and, learn right. i don't know right. that, that's just me and the diff one of the big differences too um though there are there is like say calvary chapel they they do do expositional preaching and uh and that is that is really good and you know to be encouraged a lot of charismatic churches really don't do that it's more it's more topical and it's more about, you know, well, God, you know, I was praying and God gave me this message. And, um, you know, we were looking for inspiration when we're, want, when we're gonna preach, we wanna be inspired by the Holy Spirit, we wanna be empowered by the Holy Spirit. But it is, uh, it is coming out of the word as opposed to something that we're getting like directly from God and then kind of trying to throw in some verses to, to uh, make it, you know, I guess have more uh, more weight. Uh, but I do appreciate. I mean, one of the things that you can appreciate about the Pentecostals or Charismatics is, I mean, in general, they're, I think they're they're warm, they're friendly, they're they're enthusiastic. Uh, but I, you know, I, um, Yeah. At the same time, we want them to be we want them to be taught by, uh, you know, by by the word of God. We want them to really 
be able to grow up in in the in the faith in all the ways that that we need to and as you know going back to our experience that was one of the things that we just really struggled with because uh we weren't we weren't really getting the word of god in uh a, a kind of systematic or expositional you know it's, it's not so much that the point of the sermon is the point of the text but it's like the point of the sermon is whatever is impressed upon the preacher to preach you know mm. yeah it's sad um and i i did notice that and l- l- let me l- let me show you another meme here what does this tell you <laughs> Well, yeah, I mean, that's that's the other part of, I guess, the big difference that I had mentioned was that when we started going to a church that was more Reformed, um, and it was kind of a transitional stage for us, you know, into even, you know, a, a, a little bit more Reformed church. But the music kind of reflects your theology, right? It reflects whether or not you're... Uh, going you know trying to instruct people by uh, in god's word in every phase of the worship service or if it's just you know like in this case you know there's only the word oh and i guess you're supposed to sing that over and over and over again you know and uh, we had an experience years ago at a pentecostal church where we sang the same song and it was an old old pentecostal song um uh that's entitled it's beginning to rain and we sang that same song i i'm i i don't want to exaggerate but it seemed like it was at least for a half an hour over and over again and there weren't a bunch of verses it's just basically you know a chorus and but the idea was to get us into a you know get us into um i guess a well, in, into what they consider to be a worshipful state of mind, you know, into a state of mind where we were in tune with the spirit and stuff. But sometimes those types of things do actually kind of uh, put you into a more suggestible state. And so that's part of the reason why the lyrics are repeated over and over again. And there's not a lot of depth to them. It's not about thinking so much. It's about um, experiencing again. Yeah, there's a lot of uh, churches out there. Um, actually, there's a documentary. I forgot who makes it, and I have I have not watched it. If you have watched this documentary that I'm kind of referring to, and I totally forgot the name, please drop the comment below. Let me know the name. And it's about exposing Hillsong and exposing Brian Houston and exposing Bethel and Elevation, those type of worship bands, worship music, right? And they're, they're they're exposing their taxes um, that they're invading taxes. They're they're exposing all the scandals in terms of, uh, it, you know, hiring and the money and all the stuff that's like behind the music, right? And it's a very uh, interesting documentary. I, I have not seen it, but it's a very uh, uh, informational type documentary. It's all factual. It was like on Fox News. It was on CNN. It was pretty much everywhere. Uh, you know, all the scandals. You know what I mean? Within Hillsong, Bethel, Elevation, and others that are very popular. And yeah, I, you know, when I went to these Pentecostal um, churches and it was very loud, the music was so, it, it reminded me like a concert. Mm. You know, I was like, like my ears started hurting. And I was not in the front. I was like toward the middle and I was like, ouch. You know what I mean? Yeah. I, can't even, I cannot even say amen. I was like, I had to say ouch. And then <laughs> another another thing is like, I was like, how come they have so much like spotlight, man? I'm like, like I'm not that far away from the con. I mean, from like the stage, you know. What I mean? It's not, it's not Red Rocks. Like, what are they doing? You know what I mean? It's like an overload of lights. So I was like, come on. And I was like, is the Beatles supposed to come out or who? Like, is someone special supposed to be performing? Like, what's going on here? <laughs> and then yeah. another thing I noticed was the lyrics. I was like, a repetitive thing, like you said. I was like, there's a song called "Break My Chain." or break your chain or something like that. And I get it. The Lord breaks us and frees us. Right. Uh, but, and how can it be? Remember that one song? And how can it be? You know, the dungeon flame of light. I, I woke up, my chains 
fell off and I, I rose up and followed him. I probably butchered that quote, but basically that's where they get it from, I think. And it's like, well, like that one song is my chains or what's that Pentecostal song? The uh, break my chain or break my chain. It's a famous song. And it's like a 20, they sing it like 20 times. And mm-hmm. after like, after, after, after you say it like five or six times, it's really annoying because it's like, ah, uh, like over and over again. It's like, stop, stop. Yeah. Well, and again, it's not really about, I mean, and it is less about thinking about what you're singing and more just about experiencing a, a state of uh, mind or, you know, like, I mean, there's a, there's, there is something about, getting people into an altered state of consciousness by singing something, you know, it's kind of like saying a mantra over and over again. And whether or not that's the intention, you know, I you know, we couldn't say, but it does kind of have that effect in that it's, you kind of turn your mind off at that point. You're not thinking about what's being sung because you don't need to think about it. Yeah. Yeah. So here's another one. Now, now, this is the this when I found this meme, I was like, "This is how I felt, man. This is how I felt. I felt this, especially, um, like I felt this a little bit in the church service. Obviously, there's church services like this that are a little bit more than other churches. I get it. Not every Pentecostal church does this, where they bite the carpet or they slap each other with like the flags or they take off the jackets and they hit each other. I get it. Not every Pentecostal church does that. I get it." But right. when I went, when when I started going to the prayer meetings and stuff like that, it, it was it was a little bit like it started edging towards this way. It was trending towards this, and I was just standing there like Spock, like um, why can't y'all be normal? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was, you know, and it's so true. It's like why did he have to like cripple up and like just like shake and bounce back and forth and like you know what I mean and you know, it, it, there's this yeah. one comedian, uh, Richard Richard Dawkins or Richard Hawkins. It's a Christian comedian. Um, I forgot his name. Uh, do, you, do, you, do you know what I'm talking about? The, the the one who sings and like. Yeah, I forget his name too. But. Yeah, and, and he has a joke where he's like, if there's like different types of worship, you know what I mean? There's like the school teacher where you're waving your hand. <laughs> there's like the, you know, your pocket. You, you have your hands in your pocket and you're waving your elbows. <laughs> it's like worship. And, uh, there's like carrying the TV where you're like holding your hands out like that, carrying the TV. <laughs> there's like different positions of worship. Right, right. Yeah. <laughs> was, uh, so, so, so talk about, you know, people biting the carpet. Uh, why, why do the people like do that in, in these charismatic churches? Well, I, you know, why exactly, I mean, they believe or they're led to believe by some uh, charismatic, you know, leaders that that is what happens when you come in contact with the Holy Spirit. And since they're uh, um, the anointed, you know, person of God, then if, if you are sensitive to open to what God's doing, then you're going to have these type of bodily manifestations happen to you, whether it's falling over or shaking or laughing. You know, what, that was the big thing with uh, 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 when one uh, gentleman who, you know, went all around uh, with his laughing revival. And, you know, it just, it is just, it really does descend into what, I think it can only be described as weirdness. You know, it's like um, you don't really see this in the Bible, even, you know, in the apostolic period. I mean, the only people that fell down in church died, you know, like Ananias and Sapphira. <laughs> yeah. You know, or, or in the case of, you know, like when they encountered God's presence, they fell on their faces, but generally that's not what's happening. I mean, you're in a line and, the uh, the preacher comes by and you know touches you um, to pray for you and and then if you're if you're sufficiently open to uh, God then you're gonna you know fall backwards and you know and it's 
And it just, you know, it, it just is, as I said, weird. I mean, and um, there's there's no real reason to believe that there's any spiritual benefit from all that stuff, you know. I mean, other than the fact that people kind of are going to come in and think you're you're kind of crazy. I mean, what's the spiritual benefit? I mean, supposedly you're going to go from where you're at and, and where you're struggling, you know, what those struggles you have, or even, you know, a lot of times the idea is that you're going to be healed or, or set free in some way or another. But uh, where's, where's the evidence that that's really something that is, is actually happening? I mean, uh, People get up and go home, and are they really in any in any way? Are they uh, more spiritually healthy? Are they are they more spiritually mature? Uh, you know, and and we're definitely for for prayer and for you know. I mean, if you if you want to kneel down, or even if you want to fall on your face in you know, especially in your private prayer, it's just uh, to make it into kind of what ends up being like a sideshow. You know, it just seems like. Uh, you know, it's hard to see any real biblical precedent for that. Yeah, and, and it becomes uh, an addiction. You know what I mean? People like it. You know, it, it becomes fun. And it becomes disorderly. It becomes disorderly when it happens from in the church setting. And yeah. it, it becomes disorderly. People walk in. And it is no longer about the word of God. It's no longer focused on the sermon, the application of the sermon. It, it, it becomes a distraction, really. Um, so let me go ahead and show you this one real quick. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know if you ever experienced this, but I heard a Pentecostal say that when the pastor lays on my head, uh, lays his hand on my on my shoulders or on my head, I feel like a warm sensation. I feel the fire of the Holy Spirit, and I found his meme that totally just you know it hits it on the spot. Yeah. So, what 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 is it with pastors laying their hands on people and like feeling the fire on, on their forehead for some reason? I don't really know exactly. I mean, except I mean, I know whenever I was up there being prayed for, you know, I felt embarrassed, and so I was probably feeling warm because of that. But uh, you know, I I mean. There's there's stories about people you know feeling basically like electricity going through them and um, all of that but I never I never experienced anything like that I mean it is kind of a psychosomatic thing for a lot of people I think you go up and you're supposed to feel something you're supposed to have this certain certain reaction and so no I don't doubt that they may be feeling something but what you know where's it coming from. I mean, I, I wouldn't necessarily attribute it to anything spiritual. It's It may just be kind of more of a psychological thing that you know, you're expecting to feel something, and so you do. But again, where's, you know, where's the biblical precedent for it? I mean, there is something about laying hands on people to ordain them, right? But uh, other than that, I mean, I don't I don't know where you get that from, you know, except that somebody says you know look i've got i've got the power of the holy spirit and i can i can uh, lay my hands on you like the apostles and there was something in that era that they did do and and evidently when the apostles laid hands on people uh those people did receive uh some abilities and stuff in certain cases to uh you know, do do miracles and and stuff as well, but you know, do, if if we don't have apostles around today, and uh, it just seems to me like, you know, it, it just it it's really open to a lot of lot of kind of chicanery, and just where's your focus? Your focus is not on Christ, but it's on it's on the person that's on the stage, you know, and are they even really trying to get you to focus on Christ or they want to get you to focus on something else? And, uh, you know, and it's, 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 it's tough because I really think that the vast majority of people involved in, in charismatic and Pentecostal circles are uh, genuinely trying to follow, you know, what they think is the truth. And, 
you know, I, you know, I just, I guess I feel, I feel for them having been involved in it for as long as we were. And, you know, I not, of course, wanting to just slam it and make it sound like, oh, that's all just so, so foolish. But we always just have to look at what God's word says and say, okay, does God's word give us this um, practice? Does it give us a reason to believe that we should be involved or in something like, like, uh, you know, laying out of hands and feeling electricity go through your body or something like that, you know? Right. Let me show you this one real quick. It's the last one. So instant worship. You get it. You could go to King Supers and buy this. You know what I mean? You could go to the Pentecostal church probably and they probably sell it. It's the best Sundays, very best instant worship available in Christendom. Um, you know, there's a special right now, 10.99. You can use your King Supers card and get one of these. <laughs> it's flavor yeah. variety for all. Uh, it's a uh, it's narcissist it's narcissistic. Uh, a lot of Pentecostals pastors leaders. It's all about them. It's all about the personality. It's all about the pastor, and it really comes down to the church government. You know that's one thing I have against Pentecostalism, is that you don't find that you don't find that form of ecclesiastical government, church government. And I talked about church government in another episode, but you know you, you don't find that one man rules the show you know what i mean that that's kind of like roman that's what roman catholic believe right with the pope they he, he believes he runs the he runs the show obviously they you know came up with that later on in what in the fourth fifth sixth century but you don't find that in the early century you don't find that in the bible in the bible and, and it's narcissism it, it comes down to that person that person's ego that person's agenda hunger for power obviously where people, you know what I mean, money could change a person. You know what I mean? Money, look what money did to, uh, what you call it, many innocent people in Hollywood. You know what I mean? Uh, so obviously it's going to impact the church. Um, you right. know, music, like back to the music, uh, is very similar to the, to, to the different types of styles of what I hear on the radio. You know what I mean? Like, uh, yeah, I don't know, what the, you know, dra Imagine Dragons. Uh, Mariah Carey type stuff, you know, the melody. And you know what I mean? Is, is, is it wrong to listen to that kind of worship in your car? Possibly not. Is it edifying? Depends. Depends. I don't know. Um, is it the best? Probably not. <laughs> you know what I mean? Would you have some? Yeah. What's Which your thoughts big, on that? The biggest difference, I think, between the, you know, and it's not just the traditional charismatic art or, um, uh, Pentecostal churches because there's a lot of uh, churches that would style themselves as evangelical and not really part of you know the the movement that we're talking about but they have adopted a lot of those same type of I guess man-centered kind of approach you know like you have you have the charismatic leader you have you have uh, you know, kind of the shallow, the shallow uh, sermons and and the shallow worship songs and and the, but the focus is on uh, not not re really where it should be is the big problem and it and it really does hinder people's growth. I mean, it's not just like well, we don't like that or you know we don't like the flashing lights and we don't like the loudness and um, in my case, you know, I'm an old fuddy duddy uh, these days, right? But uh the the thing is if we care about our brothers and sisters in Christ we want them to really be able to grow and the only way to grow is um by grace and you know and the knowledge of God i mean you have to have some serious uh theology that underneath all that you're doing and because the theology is i guess where it's at you you have it the methodology that follows that is uh, much, I guess, uh, much more centered on, uh, as we said, just kind of a, almost like a therapeutic um, experience or, uh, and it is kind of narcissistic as well. It goes along with the culture. I mean, the culture is that way. And so the church becomes more and more that way. 
because you have to be like the world if you're going to reach the world is the is the mentality yeah that's sad you know what i mean and, and to close out you know there, there's a lot of different books um uh, available for people to buy go on amazon you know what i mean do, do your research go 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 into the bible uh be a brian and you take the sermon you know what i mean and you know, how do you know if you're too involved into the Pentecostal movement? How do you know if you're caught up in its, some of its false tenets? Well, check yourself, right? Check yourself. Uh, yeah. Put your finger on the put your finger on the pulse. Keep your finger in the text, right? Like like how people say. Uh, you know, if, if people say if you hear if you hear in the sermon, the church needs to be saved by miracles once again. And if you're like, hmm, that sounds great. Well, you should check yourself and be like, are people saved by miracles? Obviously, salvation is a miracle. It's the greatest miracle. It's better than any kind of miracle, salvation. Yeah. When, a sinner, when a sinner repents, there's a celebration of angels. That's the best miracle, right? That's the best miracle. Um, but yeah. miracles as the Red Sea, as turning water into wine, walking on water, the spectacular, right? The, 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 the extraordinary. Is that what saves the sinner it does not save the sinner what saves the sinner is what always saves the sinner it's the gospel the gospel is the power yeah. of god it's the power of god unto salvation it, it, the paul doesn't say working miracles is the power of god unto salvation right, right. It's, it's the gospel um, yeah. that is the power of god and 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 and, and if you cannot say amen to that then you may be too much involved into that Pentecostal stuff. Um, and you, you need to get back to the word, right? And yeah. keep yeah. your finger in the keep your finger in the text. Now, there's a couple of books out there that I would recommend. One of them is uh, Charismatic Chaos by John MacArthur. It's, it's a popular one. Uh, let me see. There's uh, there's an article. Oh, 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 yeah. Uh, Justin Peters. If you don't know Justin Peters, uh, Strange Fire of um, Conferences back in the day at Grace Community Church. Uh, Justin Peters has like a huge, huge uh, investment in articles, uh, you know, tons of things that he has, he has said and wrote uh, exposing charismatics and exposing the falseness of Pentecostalism. So go ahead and check out Justin Peters. That's a great resource. And I interviewed Justin Peters, what was the last year, talking about expository preaching and stuff like that. Um, um, there's an article, and I'll, I'll, I'll drop the link to this, uh, by B.B. Warfield. He wrote this a long time ago, and it's an article called The Cessation of the, uh, the Charismata, uh, talking about, you know, the need uh, of the gift, and are they continuous or they are not continuous. And it's a great little article, you know what I mean? Because this was happening in the 20s, and he was responding to some of that. And what he said on this article is actually really concise, it's sharp, it's nuclear. <laughs> it's great, great resource. Uh, Patrick, do you have any other resources, obviously, um, off the top of your head, that you would recommend people to, continuing, to continue their study to check this at the door, yeah. per se? And the one, the ones you mentioned are good, of course. And really, the main thing that changed our minds was just reading our Bibles, and uh, you know, listening. I mean, if you listen to uh, some more reformed uh, preachers and teachers, um, you know, Sinclair Ferguson comes to mind. Uh, you know, there, there's a lot of them out there that are really are really good at, at preaching Christ and preaching the gospel. Uh, Sinclair Ferguson's book, uh, uh, The Whole Christ, is really good. Um, it's a little more advanced, maybe, but he's he's a very good communicator, and the way he writes is is pretty accessible. Um, but really, it, it comes down to what does the Word of God say? And if you're convinced at this point that, yeah, I mean, charismatic gifts are for today and you know we're all wet and don't really have the spirit the way we should i mean okay like but look into god's word and and continue really to study what god's word says about it and um, i think that what we're the direction of trying to point you will 
it will become more apparent that it is um, what is revealed in God's word. And we're not trying to take anything away from you. We just we want you to to have the real deal, and we want you to continue to be able to grow um, in you know in grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior. So, uh, you know, my experience, my opinion doesn't really mean much uh, compared to God's word. So get into God's word, you know, and and uh, read it, read it, study it, you know, uh, and, and uh, you know, try to understand it more, more and more. And I think that, that will help you more than anything. Amen. Amen. All right. Well, thank you so much for, you know, tuning in to Bible Theory, checking it out. Uh, if this has been a blessing, go ahead and subscribe, share this on, you know, with your friends on social media and stuff like this. And uh, take out your phones. Do me a favor. Take out your phones and uh, hit the subscribe button right now and go ahead and rate the podcast on your iTunes, Google podcast. Give it a five star. That'd be great. Anyway, well, until next time. Uh, you know, stay faithful, keep the faith, and God bless.